Michelle, I've got about two minutes after. I think whenever you're ready to get started, we can kick this off. Okay, <clears throat> I'm ready when you are, Mr. Springer. I am ready uh, to get started here. The only thing I'm gonna do here is I'm just gonna make sure my volume's up all the way. I think it's about as good as I can get it. Okay. Um, all right, well, Michelle, if you're ready, I'm ready. And I just wanna welcome everyone who's joining this RIA Town Hall. Happy holidays to everyone who uh, hopefully had a great Thanksgiving and like me is probably amazed that we are at the end of the year. Uh, unbelievable how quickly this year has moved by us and we're very thankful as we reflect on the past year over all of the positive things that are happening in the restoration industry right now. Of course, it's a very interesting time to be in the restoration industry. And uh, I'm thankful for uh, a lot of positive things that are happening uh, in the industry right now. I want to just let everyone know that this uh, town hall meeting that we're, we're very grateful you have joined is being recorded. It will be available in the future, but be, please be mindful that this recording, although it is live, is also being recorded. So uh, avoid any statements that you do not want to be rebroadcast. Uh, so with that in mind, I'm also thankful that Michelle Blevins has agreed to join us today. Michelle, thank you for joining us and being willing to moderate this session. We appreciate your acumen of the restoration industry and being willing to jump in with us here and have this conversation. Um, I also do want to thank folks for their uh, willingness to be flexible here with us as we started to uh, explore what Facebook Live for this large of a group uh, joining us online was going to entail. Uh, we realized that Zoom was just going to be a much better platform for this. And so we certainly apologize to anyone who was trying to log into Zoom. And if you've had to uh, at, get frustrated in trying to log on to Facebook Live and then you weren't able to join us live and you had to watch the recording, we apologize uh, as we have um, town halls in the future, which we in certainly uh, uh, hope will continue to be uh, a way that we can communicate with our members and constituents. Uh, we hope that in the future, this will not have any uh, further confusion. Uh, you got to love technology until you have to deal with technology. So uh, with that, Michelle, I'm going to turn over to you and uh, let's kick off this discussion. We also have there on your video uh, Mrs. Katie Smith. Katie, thanks for being here as well. Uh, Katie is a lot of times our uh, technology and social media guru, so we're uh, uh, grateful for Katie spearheading a lot of this. And Katie also is a member of the executive committee for RIA's board of directors. Uh, she is a member of the AGA committee, which I know there's sometimes people have questions about what is the AGA committee. We'll talk more about that. And so uh, I just want Katie to feel very comfortable at any point that Mark is rambling uh, to jump in and offer her comments or uh, clarifications if that's needed. So Katie, thank you for being here as well. And at any point, you just feel free to jump right in. All right, Michelle, it's all yours. Well, thank you very much to the RIA for inviting me to be part of today. This is really um, exciting. I'm glad to be part of these discussions. There's so much happening in the industry right now, and it really is exciting. Um, I wanted to go over a couple housekeeping things since we are using Zoom, and there are more people joining us right now. If you are joining right now, can you please be sure that your microphone is muted and your video is off? You can do that by hovering over the screen. And on the bottom left, there's a mute button and a stop video button. That will avoid us from having any technical difficulties, any feedback, stuff like that. Um, and again, as Mark said, this is being recorded, so just just, you know, be aware of that. Um, there is also a chat option at the bottom. Again, if you hover over your screen, you can click on chat. And there's a group chat that will pop up on the right hand side of the screen. So if you have questions along the way, please feel free to type them there and Mark or I will try to get to them and address them maybe toward the end or throughout if there's time. So um, we're here today to discuss a myriad of issues related to the restoration industry, especially things related to the RIA's Advocacy and Government Affairs Committee and its mission. So I want to go ahead and jump right in at this point. Um, and I want to start by asking Mark to just really explain what the AGA committee is all about, what its purpose is, 
who's part of that committee, the mission and where they're where you guys are headed. Yep. Thanks, Michelle. So yeah, this is a question that of course has piqued a lot of interest over this past year. There's been such a frenzy of activity. There's been so much posted in the uh, many places there is for people to communicate in this day and age in the property restoration industry. And so um, I, I hope to clarify some things around that. Uh, first of all, the AJ committee is just that. It's a committee uh, of the Restoration Industry Association. It's not its own entity. It doesn't operate outside of the governance and the mission and the strategic goals of the Restoration Industry Association. So it's very much underneath that direction, the board of directors of the Restoration Industry Association, which is a large board. I mean, we have, I believe, 20 board members that represent a very wide cross-section of the restoration industry. We have uh, um, primarily uh, restoration operators who are uh, on the board. Most of the of the members of the board operate, like myself and Katie, operate restoration companies. Um, many of the folks that are uh, on the board are folks who've been operating restoration companies for a long time. Um, but we don't only have that. We know that the vendors who uh, work with the restoration industry also have an important voice. So we have some vendor representation. Uh, we have some folks who are in the consulting world who also are represented on the board. And so, again, what it re represents is not only a, a lot of operators, but it also represents a wide cross-section of the different uh, constituents we have in the industry, both geographically and then from really diverse background as well. We have young people, we have middle-aged people, we have, I can't call them older, but we have um, experienced uh, people on, in the industry. We have uh, men, we have women. Uh, so, so we really have a wide and diverse uh, group of folks. And all of these, of course, are operating within the uh, the governance and the bylaws that we have, which mean you can't be on the board forever. So it's not as though we have anyone on the board who's been on the board for 30 years who just is directing or pulling the strings behind the scenes. So uh, RA, of course, is a, is a long-standing organization. It's been around uh, this, this next year. It will be 74 years. We're excited in 2021. We'll have our 75th uh, anniversary. It's a very strong organization as far as its financial management. RA is probably in the best place it's ever been financially. And so all these things that we're blessed to be able to do, we take very seriously because we believe that as members of the board, we represent first and foremost our members. And we also have a responsibility to be good stewards of, of the funds that we have, for example, and the mandate that we have. And within that, that's really where the AGA committee was born. Uh, previously, we had a legal co committee. Uh, it was, I think, called Legal and Government Committee, if I'm not mistaken, Katie. Wasn't that what it was, Legal and Government? And, and it really wasn't doing a lot. And so over the course of the last couple years in our strategic planning sessions, this goes back about, I think, four or five years. We had one of the first strategic planning sessions that I was a part of in Canton, Ohio. We started talking about all these threats that we, uh, we, we call them the existential threats that restorers face now. And these are expanding all the time. And, and really, we honed it down to uh, a couple of areas that were really key that impact restores every single day. One of them is the estimating platform uh, that we use now. And, and of course, as a lot of people are talking about right now, the issues with Xactimate specifically have become front and center. And so uh, we'll talk more, I know, about those in a little bit, but Xactware was one. The other issue is third-party consultants. All of a sudden, as restores, we started finding that we would finish a project, especially on large uh, uh, commercial projects, and after everything's completed, several months later, we have uh, this third-party consultant come into the project who says, um, hey, by the way, uh, we're going to hold your invoice hostage until you do X, Y, and Z. And this is a real problem. We have interference with contracts in these issues. We have really an unfair playing field for restorers that 
was impacting their business every single day. Uh, and then we have uh, the third party administrators, the TPAs. Uh, we had a conference in Nashville a couple years ago where we explored a lot of these issues and we see restorers businesses being affected in profound ways every single day. Of course, the last one is regulatory and legislatively as well. And contractors voice was completely lost or missing. We didn't see that restorers were having the opportunity to be a part of the discussion that affected their business every single day. And we said, we, as, at the Restoration Indo Industry Association, we have to have a very specific element of our strategy and what we are uh, working on every single day addressing these issues. And so we uh, retooled that legislative and legal uh, committee. And we uh, originally, it was, I think the first acronym we had was REGA, Restoration Advocacy and Government Affairs. I think Chris Munchak said, do we really want everyone to be talking about REGA in the, in the industry? And so we, we backed off of that. We were like, no, no, it should be the AGA, Advocacy and Government Affairs Committee. And um, from that point, uh, we built the, the committee that was more or less had been dead for a while. We built it from the ground up. And I really believe, you know, I'm a younger restorer. I'm someone who's a second generation restorer. Um, I've seen a lot in the industry, but I probably come from kind of a, a little bit of a, maybe kind of a bridge of these generations. Um, I, I felt very strongly along with a lot of the other members of the executive committee that restorers just don't have voice. Uh, we, we are not being heard. And so a major a element of what we started to move into was really two things. We yes, need to unify the industry and then we need to provide voice for the industry. That's what AGA is all about. And, and a kind of a long, sorry, that's why Katie needs to jump in from time to time. Long winded answer as to a very, very deep and it's really kind of a complex question. Uh, Michelle, so this is not just something that we like to pull out of our back pocket and it's formed in a weekend. I mean, there was a lot of, a lot that happened over a long period of time to get us to the point that this uh, grew and evolved. Perfect. Okay. Um, so I know that there are more people joining and we're hearing some audio from other people. So those of you who have just joined, please be sure to mute yourself on the bottom left of your screen. To be sure that they're muting themselves so we don't get feedback and whatnot. So, okay. I'm going to keep going here. So, um, within the AGA, one of the first things that happened was creating this committee. And for a while, I was the chair of the committee. And since then, he's been the restoration project advocate and actually hired by the RIA. So, it's my understanding that there was kind of some communication from um, and, and the AGA chair. Um, so that he's I don't really know what to say, except thank you for your let, let me interrupt you for just one second. Bye -bye. I think we have Philip Courier. Philip, if you're on there, um, if I could ask you just to mute yourself, that would be great. I'm having a hard time uh, hearing uh, you, Michelle, but I, I think your question was about, um, Ed, maybe, maybe go ahead and just uh, you, maybe restate your, your question. Shit. Nobody can do their job because. Hold on just a sec. I'm going to see if I can the, mute. It's out of the norm. Philip, can you hear me, buddy? Philip Courier? Oh, there he is. I'm going to, I think I have to, oh, there he is. He's muted. Yeah. Thank okay. you, Philip. All right, Michelle, go ahead. So, sorry, folks, as we do future town halls, we will, we will be able to come up with a uh, approach here that, that mutes everyone automatically. Yes, we are. Yes, we're learning as we go, which is good. Right. Um, okay, so I was talking about how um, Ed Cross, who's known as the restoration lawyer, he was named um, as the AGA chair in the beginning of when the AGA was formed. And since then, just in the last couple of months, he's been named the restoration contractor advocate and actually hired by the RIA to carry out this role. So how are you transitioning him out of that role as chairperson? And why did you decide on him, which you know, there are obvious reasons, I think, but why did you choose him for the restoration contractor advocate position? Yeah. So, I mean, let me ask you this question, Michelle, what are you, what do you think? Do you, what do you think of as, Ed, as far as the, as far as the guy to be the restoration advocate, do you think he's a, a good guy to take that role or do you think we should pick somebody else? I honestly can't think of anyone better to play out that role. Um, Ed knows the industry so well. He's very genuine, very passionate about the industry, has been in, in the industry for a while and knows all the key players, has advocated for a lot of contractors, including some big, big contractors. Um, he still does. And so I can't think of anybody who 
understands the industry and the legal side and what contractors face on a daily basis more than Ed does because he truly is in the trenches every single day with restorers advocating for them as it is, as their personal you know, company lawyers. So to um, come forward on behalf of the entire industry, I think is a great match. So we, we did not script that, <laughs> Michelle. That was an excellent extemporaneous answer. Uh, thank you for that. I mean, you, you summarized what I think all of us felt. And that was that Ed's the best person for this job. So within the AGA committee, we have, of course, they have a vision and a mission statement. The um, members of the AGA committee uh, represent some of the most, uh, some of the brightest and some of the strongest, most articulate restorers in the industry. I am so humbled and proud of the group of uh, people, men and women, who've been assembled to lead this effort. Um, and in that effort, there is what we call the AGA blueprint. It's the seven step plan uh, that we have chosen to orient ourselves to. It's easy for committees to get off track. And so we knew that we had to have a very specific goal and very specific plans if we were going to actually accomplish anything. There's a lot of people in the industry that talk a lot about stuff, talking about stuff, accomplishing something, two entirely different issues. So we knew if we were going to accomplish something, uh, we had to have this plan. And part of that plan was that after we had established position statements, which uh, the RA is doing, and I think it's the first time in the industry something that really should have happened a long time ago has started to happen, is that we have concise, clear position statements. That really doesn't do anything unless we have someone to go out and advocate for those position statements that we've made. And so the question was, as we moved along very quickly with this plan, I mean, much quicker than I ever would have thought it would be possible, who's going to do that? And so we opened up to the committee and to a number of thought leaders throughout the industry. I mean, I think, I think we reached out to like 50 or between 50 and 100 different thought leaders in the industry. Who do you think would be the best person to fill this role? And we had, I think... Somewhere north of Katie, if I'm wrong, just jump in and correct me. I think we had over 15 really strong nominees. Um, in that group of nominees that we had, I think a lot of people felt like Ed wasn't even an option. He was someone who was already chairing the committee. And, and it was actually, I was actually the one who initially, I called up, I think it might have been Katie or it was someone else on the executive committee and said, hey, what about Ed to be our advocate? And, uh, and everyone was kind of like, well, could Ed even do that? And, and I was like, why? Well, I, I can't imagine anyone who'd be better to do this. And so I started a dialogue with Ed on this and Ed just immediately was like, I, Mark, I can't, I can't do that. I've got my practice that is obviously growing all the time. I represent restorers. I'm going to continue to represent restorers. I'm honored to be the chair. Obviously he's doing tons and tons of work on that. And uh, a few of us just kind of didn't take no for an answer. And we kept badgering Ed about that. And here's the reason why. Not only is Ed the best person, he's the most knowledgeable person for this, but Ed has an incredible track record in something I don't think a lot of people know about, and that is being a court-appointed mediator in cases before they get to litigation in the state of California. And I think, I'm, 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 Ed may correct me on this later, but I believe that Ed has over 20 cases that he's been appointed by the court in California to mediate. And he has a 100% track record in meeting those cases successfully. And that just meant a ton to me because we don't need someone to just go in and blow, blow stuff up. We need a strong voice, but we got to get stuff changed. I mean, if we just go in and blow stuff up, it might make us feel good for a short period of time, but we need results here. We need a win. And I felt that Ed's track record in that aspect specifically would be incredibly helpful for this effort. And so we continued to try to explore ways that it, this could work for Ed and, and ultimately found that Ned wanted uh, us to be really clear with people. Ed's not retiring from Cross and Associates. What we've done is we've basically gotten a chunk of Ed's time. And, and as we've seen with what he's doing already, I mean, there is no one who is as passionate and knowledgeable and as who's able to see the issues we face so clearly 
and then take action on our behalf. And when we had talked about this blueprint, we said we need a tough as nails diplomat, okay, someone who's tough but who's also diplomatic to, to advance this. And I think in Ed, we found the, the right person. Now, ultimately, we're probably going to have multiple restoration advocates. I mean, we, we can't, as this grows and as we have opportunity, there's going to be opportunity to have other subject matter experts come in to uh, work in an advocacy role for us. Um, and, and it's, it's going to, I think, evolve over time. But for right now, for today, Ed Cross is the right man. Perfect. Okay. So um, Ed is obviously taking the role in stride and seriously. So um, the RIA's fire summit was a couple weeks ago in Las Vegas, and um, there was an opportunity for a conversation there between Ed and Xactor founder Bill Loveland. Except and uh, Ed was able to- Chapman's phone number. Was, um, people who are joining, can you please be sure to mute yourself? Thank you. Um, so Ed was able to ask Bill some kind of difficult questions. Some of you have probably seen that video. It's been circulating on Facebook for about the last week. If you haven't seen it, you can find it on the RIA Facebook page or on R&R's Facebook page um, and watch it. It's about 20 minutes and there are some good questions and interesting answers. So um, Mark, for those of us who weren't in Vegas, I know that that was actually probably a longer discussion than we saw. And so why was Bill brought into the conversation and what does everyone need to understand about that entire conversation and the scope of it and the direction, hopefully that it's going from here? Yeah. Now, so Michelle, I apologize. I'm going to close the door to my office real quick because I'm getting a little, a little noise from outside my office. I apologize to everyone who's listening. Give me 10 seconds. I'll be right back. Thank you to everyone who's here <laughs> themselves and turned off their video. We are... Uh, and we appreciate you coming over here from Facebook. That's awesome. We are um, glad to have you all here. And again, there is a chat portion on the right hand side. So if you have questions throughout, please feel free to um, type in questions and Mark will try to get to them at the end. Excellent. All right, Michelle. And so again, my apologies to everyone for having to jump away from the uh, screen there for a second. So the backstory on Vegas. So Vegas was uh, uh, what the, the technical fire summit in, in Las Vegas. It was held in conjunction uh, or co-located with the ISSA show, which is a massive show. I mean, I think there was like 15,000 people there for the ISSA show. And uh, the topic was very needed, very necessary. Uh, how do we advance fire restoration uh, within our industry? Uh, Steve Lowry and the team that put that event together did an amazing job. Um, Anytime RIA has an opportunity to get restorers together, while we want to see the technical aspects of our industry advance, we also want an opportunity to talk about what's happening within this AGA movement. And so on the first day of the event, uh, we had an update about AGA what, and, and a little bit of the backstory, how did it form, where, what are our goals? And then uh, after that, Ed started to discuss uh, some of the current discussions that are happening with Exactware right now uh, with respect to some of the challenges that we're all facing, that restorers are facing today, that we continue to face, and, and really in a lot of ways, very positive discussions are happening around these issues. And uh, in the audience was Mr. Lo Bill Loveland. Uh, Bill is one of the founders of Exactware and uh, someone who has been very involved in the industry, in the restoration industry, very supportive uh, of the restoration industry for a long time. And uh, on day two of the event, uh, after a lot of these uh, updates were provided to the attendees, uh, Mr. Loveland and Ed Cross had a discussion uh, about what Bill considered to be, what Mr. Loveland considered to be, uh, some areas where exact where was being unfairly mischaracterized. And I want to be very clear it, within RIA, our, our goal is not to embarrass anyone. Our goal is not to mischaracterize anything. We want to be fair. Um, but we also, in the spirit of fairness, want to make sure that that is a, a two-way street. We want to make sure that the environment that restorers face and that we operate in every single day is fair and sustainable. I mean, this is the, the way I talk about it all the time. Our industry has to be sustainable so that 10 years from now, as we, a lot of us, 
see the next generation of restorers start to take over, that the environment or the ecosystem that they're working within is sustainable and that they can continue to operate in that place. Because we, what we do for our customers is incredibly important. And, and what we do every single day is not only important to our customers, but all the employees we have in our companies on the teams that we run. I mean, this, what, what we have for them is their livelihood. And we're really concerned about some of the areas that, that, and some of the ways, some of the trends that we faced. And so as, as Mr. Loveland expressed this to uh, Ed, Ed offered him an opportunity uh, to address the audience and to set the record straight. And I commend Mr. Loveland for taking that opportunity. I think stepping into the, stepping onto the stage and um, taking that opportunity to, to courage uh, for what he was about to do. And, and I want to say, I mean, I've, I've used Exactware and I, for over 25 years. And I think in a lot of ways, Exactware uh, is a great tool. I think the way that Mr. Loveland and his family members, when they designed that, it it was designed to help contractors. It was designed to to be something that would would be a good and useful tool in our industry. And I, and Mr. Loveland and I, when we talked about this over the years, we talked about Exactware just being a tool. It's a tool to help us in our businesses. And um and, and so that's how that started. Uh, Mr. Loveland. Um, asked for the opportunity to set the record straight. He stepped onto the stage. Mr. Cross made it clear that the uh, entire session was being recorded, that everyone should be careful about any comments that they made uh, there in that setting. And of course, what transpired next um, was uncomfortable. And it was, I think for a lot of people that were there, it was a little awkward. Um, <laughs> someone told me it felt like they were watching mom and dad have an argument. And, um, you know, again, our, we, it was not our goal in that scenario to, um, to, to embarrass Mr. Loveland at all. And I, I think some people may see it that way, but that wasn't our goal. Um, our goal is to have a place again where restorers can get answers to where we can see an environment that has not been equitable can change. And while it's unfortunate that some of it's uncomfortable, I think if we're going to change this industry, we're going to have to be okay with some uncomfortable discussions, period. Because every single day across the state of Montana, I have six locations across the state of Montana, we work on thousands of claims every single year. And every single week, somewhere across the state of Montana, one of my estimators writes an estimate and an adjuster comes back to my estimator and says, um, we aren't going to pay this invoice. Well, why not, Mr. Adjuster? Because you're not using the exact word price list. Uh, we only pay off the exact word price list. And we have uh, told the adjusters, well, we can't use the exact word price list because it's not accurate. It doesn't represent the pricing in our marketplace. And the adjuster says, well, that's too bad. I mean, you're, you're going to have to do something about that, but I, I can only pay the exact for a price list. And that situation is not acceptable. I, it's not acceptable to me and my company, and it shouldn't be acceptable to any restoration company. Because I don't think restoration companies should be able to charge whatever they want to charge, uh, but they should be able to charge fair market pricing. And I, I will point out specifically, the area that is, it, it should never have gotten to where it is today, but it's what we face every single day in our restoration companies is that restoration labor is right now at half the price of equivalent trades. If you take a electrician, if you look at a HVAC mechanic, if you look at a, a journeyman plumber, if you look at any of those trades, they, the restoration technician is half that value. And I can tell you this, I compete with the exact same labor pool for those people um, in my marketplace. And I can't pay people the $12.48 or whatever at cleaning the base price that the Xactimate uh, labor retail price is based on and compete in my marketplace. And so what we've been told and what Mr. Loveland said when he addressed these issues is that, you know, you have to provide feedback and you have to help us with this. 
And I can say in good conscience, and I can look Mr. Loveland in the eye, and I could look any person in the eye and say, you know what? That is exactly what we have done. My company, we have uploaded thousands of estimates that reflect our local price. We have called Exactware dozens of times to provide feedback. And you know what? Until very, very recently, that didn't change. And in many areas, it still isn't changing. And until that is that voice is heard, and until we can change this issue, we're going to keep having uncomfortable conversations. And people are going to, they may be upset about it, and they may feel that some people may say it's not fair. And, and I can just say, if we want to talk about fairness, I can get you a room of 100 restorers, and we can talk about what's fair. Because what we've dealt with for a long time isn't fair. And it's not fair to their families. It's not fair to the future of this industry. And as long as that continues, I'm going to fight this fight. And I know some people don't like it when I use words like fight, but right now, until we can move the needle on this, it's going to be just that. Katie, did I, do you, I, I see you're shaking your head somewhat, but do you have anything you want to add to that? Because I know you, you are involved with the AGA committee and, and you are obviously involved in a lot of these discussions. Um, feel free to pull me back between the guardrails if needed. I think you're right on the point. I just want to add that anything that we're doing is not to, to be sensational. It's that we have a job to do and we want to get it done. And we want to be good stewards of the people who have made an investment in this movement. And Ed is working on our behalf. And we just want someone to, or contractors to feel like someone has their back. But more important, we want to be transparent with our members, obviously, but with everyone that's, that's involved. And so it's not for likes, it's not for shares, it's to get a job done. And we're going to keep doing whatever it takes to do to get that job done. And, and, and some of that's going to be hard. And, you know, sometimes there's, there's outcomes that people don't agree on. Uh, there's a lot of different ways we can go about this. But what I feel very comfortable and very confident with is we have some of the best minds in the industry speaking into this issue. I mean, that this is a thankless job in a lot of ways. I tell people who want to get involved on the RA board, I say, that's great, but it's going to be a lot of work. Most of the work that you're going to do is never going to be recognized. No one's going to ever know what you've done. And you're never, ever going to get paid for this. It's only going to cost you money. Uh, you know, I, I was looking back at my time over the last year. I got like a, over a thousand hours into RA over the last year. And all that's done is cost me money. Every time I get on an airplane and go somewhere, it costs me money. I don't get reimbursed from that. I don't get a stipend for that. I don't get a salary for that. I don't get anything for that. But we do this because we think it's the right thing to do. And because we care, this industry has given a lot to us. We need to be able, I, I use this description all the time. We need to be able to leave this better than we found it. And if we can unite around that, let's leave this better than we found it. Let's not be fractured anymore. Let's work together and let's leave this thing better than we found it. Beautiful. Okay. So <clears throat> I want to move away from the AGA stuff a little bit and talk a little bit more about the RIA and its mission. Um, every year the RIA has some kind of summit. So this year it was the fire summit. Last year it was the content summit, which I had the privilege of attending in Detroit. Um, before that there was a TPA summit in Nashville. Um, so the RIA is really big on continuing education. So um, can you talk a little bit about the FIRE Summit from this year and what the overall goal of that summit was outside of obviously this discussion that kind of took the center of Absolutely. the event? Absolutely. Absolutely. And Katie was there too, so I'll let her offer some perspective after I offer mine. Um, RIA hosts a, a fall event every year. Of course, our big event is the convention in the spring. Uh, the technical summits are smaller. Uh, generally, we target 100 to 150 people for those events because what we hear from our members a lot is that they enjoy more than anything else the networking that is available with other members, particularly within a smaller context. So generally, we limit those. I mean, I know the TPA event, for example, was a sold-out event. We stopped accepting registrations for that one because, it, it again, we want to facilitate that discussion. But, you know, the, the specifics of the FIRE Summit, so I believe that a lot of our industry has matured around uh, mold remediation and around restorative drying. There are so many resources available to so many contractors who do an unbelievable job in uh, drying structures, remediating structures, 
And, and in a lot of ways, we've just seen the maturation of our industry in that area. One of the areas that we, we feel that we're behind and that we really need to advance and to grow our industry is in the area of fire restoration. And a lot of folks don't like fire restoration. Fire restoration is, you know, I, I call it sometimes the red, red-headed stepchild of the industry. They're dirty jobs. Contents are hard to deal with. People don't like the repair side of, the, of those jobs. Um, in my company, we love fire jobs. I mean, we love fires. They're, the, the jobs are... Are, are so rewarding in what you offer your customers. Um, you know, if you ask someone on their deathbed, you know, what were what were the big events in your life that were the most difficult for you? They're probably if, if they had a major fire in their house, a fire that's going to be probably one of the most difficult things our customers have ever went through in their life. And we have such an amazing opportunity in those fires to make that situation so much better for them if we do it right. And we as an industry, you know, usually when I get called into litigation support, more often than not, it's litigation support and a fire restoration that went bad or that went wrong. And we, we as an industry need to police that a little bit more. We need to see fire restoration as a science advance. And so that was our objective. That was our goal with the fire summit was advancing the science around fire restoration because Fire restoration companies need to, we need, we need to take it as serious as we take mold and, and water losses. And so that's why we did it. We also launched in tandem with the Fire Summit, the Fire Loss Specialist Certification. So this is the first advanced fire certification. This is geared primarily as a target demographic, project managers, uh, building or, or business owners, uh, restoration superintendents, the people who have to take a fire loss from the very, it's very inception all the way through uh, the approval through municipalities, negotiation with insurance companies, approval for code upgrades, the, the structural demolition, all the way through the repairs. And so this program hasn't existed in our industry. And again, it's one of these things I think should have existed 30 years ago. And so this was launched uh, not only at that event, but also in, um, in unity with IICRC. This was one of the first tangible um, pieces of the agreement that RIA and IICRC uh, moved into back in the spring. Uh, we launched it at the IICRC headquarters in Las Vegas. That's why we chose Las Vegas as, a, as the, the place that we uh, launched this. And um, it's exciting because ICRC is going to expand the, the reach for this to tens of thousands of people who can get this certification now. And, and we as an industry have an opportunity to really advance something that has needed advancement for a really long time. And so that was some of what, what happened behind the scenes on that. I'm so excited and so proud to be working with ICRC on this. I mean, as an industry, we need to work together. And ICRC, we, we, we are working with them on the fire standard as well. We are fully supporting that effort. Uh, one of the people who chaired the fire standard when we were working on it, John Pletcher, is now the vice chair of the standard over for ICRC. And we're working on some cool things to try to further unify things like our code of ethics and code of conduct, for example. Why do we have a bunch of these in our industry? Why don't we have one that we all agree to and work from? And so as leaders within ICRC and RA, these are the sort of things we're working on that, again, for me, anytime that we can be working to unify, anytime that we can be working to build voice, we're doing a good thing and that's what we're going to stay focused on. Yes, absolutely. All right. So on that note, so I know that there are some people watching today who probably are not RIA members. So Mark, why is now truly like probably one of the best times ever to jump on board? It's time to be an RIA member, get involved. There are many ways to get involved. Um, and there are a lot of benefits to being an RIA member. So Mark, can you detail a few of those? I would love to do that, but I, I would love for Katie to tackle that first, um, mostly because I'm, you know, you put a quarter in me and wind me up and there I go. So I think just so everyone doesn't get fatigued of having to listen to me, I'm going to let Katie tackle that one. I might jump in at the end. Um, uh, but, you know, Katie's uh, business in North Carolina is so, uh, it, it's it's so typical. I think of a lot of restoration companies now and that they're it's a second generation company as well. And, and Katie has such a great way of explaining why RA is important to her. So I'm going to let her tackle that when I'll jump in at the end. Thank you, Mark. Um, and for me personally, the best way that, that I got involved in RIA was just to go through the advanced designations. And I just built relationships there that just led um, from one place to another and, and finding um, different ways to serve and different ways to get involved. And, 
Um, this is just a really exciting time for RIA right now and um, the relationships that, that you can build within this group are just um, things that can help you every day in your business. And there aren't many days that I don't reach out to someone that I've met through this group and just, you know, bounce ideas off, you know, back and forth and just say, hey, I need some help with this. And um, you may be across the country, but um, it's just nice to have that, that relationship. And we provide so many different platforms for people to gather and to network. And we're just at a time right now where everybody says we're fragmented and we're trying to fix that and we're stronger together. And um, we just, we want to make sure that we're united and we're working so hard with so many different organizations to make sure that, that we're a voice, one voice, and we're speaking the same message. And that's been something that we've needed for a long time. And, and so this is the time to get involved with RIA to be part of the voice. Okay, so Katie, let's keep with you here for a minute. So for the contractors who are already members, what are some things that they can do to be more involved at this point? Well, obviously we want everybody on board with, with the AGA movement. Um, we've had an influx of people who say, I wanna get involved, I wanna get involved. And we're trying to reach out to them personally and, and make sure we respond. Um, the best thing to do right now is go to restorationindustry.org and uh, go to advocacy. And from there you can catch up on where we are if you're not up to speed. Um, but there's a place where you can fill out a questionnaire and obviously we, we need investments that that's something that we have to have, but we need time, we need money, we need ideas, all of the things. And so there are different ways that you can um, give back to AGA, you can get involved. Um, so if you are not aware of what's going on right now, that's the best thing you can do is just get up to speed and, and go ahead and um, sign up. And if, if you don't want to make an investment today, that's fine, let us earn your trust. But um, if there's something that you do very well, if, if maybe it's um, you work with a lot of uh, consultants and you've got a lot of experience with that, we can absolutely use your, your expertise on one of our committees. So um, get in the system and, and get your information to us right now and, and join the movement. Mark, do you have anything else you wanna add on becoming new member or getting more involved as a current member? So two couple comments. Um, the first one would be as to, uh, beyond what Katie said, which was a great summary. Um, plan on being in New Orleans. Uh, I believe it's April. Is it April thirteenth, Katie? It's on our website. Obviously, that that is the yeah. International Restoration Expo. If you want to find out what's happening in the restoration industry, I think anyone who was there in Phoenix last spring left uh, empowered. They left encouraged. They left with new tools in their tool belt, and that's what we want to do. I, as a board, we talk all the time. If we can't add value to our members, then we can't do it. We have to provide the value to the average restoration company who's working in Topeka, Kansas, or Portland, Maine, or wherever they're at. Uh, it. My goal is for anyone who looks at RIA to say, I can't afford to not be a member of this. And so if you show up in New Orleans, that is a great place for you to get involved. And here, here's some of our challenge is that we get uh, with this AGA movement now, we have hundreds and hundreds of people who have said, hey, I want to get involved. But, you know, it, it, what we need is we need to know that the people who want to participate are actually going to participate because over the years I have had many, many people who say, hey, I want to get involved. And what sometimes folks do, they want to add to their resume, build their resume, you know, be on a committee, put that on their resume. But this is hard work. I mean, showing up to phone to conference calls and talking about the hard stuff that happens behind the scenes that never shows up in lights and never shows up in magazines or on posts or whatever else, that, that doesn't, uh, a lot of people don't like doing that. But it's hard work. So what you need to do is let us get to know you, show up, and be ready to do hard work. And be prepared to do hard work in a way that's professional. Um, because when we get together, you know, we, you, you can make a name for yourself and saying a lot of nasty stuff and blowing stuff up. But we need people who actually want to make it better. And, and that means that you've got to do it in a way that's professional and you've got to do it in a way that's going to help the industry move forward. And if people want to do that, you know, when I was a really young guy in the industry, I remember saying, hey, I want to help out. And I kind of got pushed. I kind of got the, the stiff arm. And initially, you know, I know how that feels. I was discouraged by it. 
And I felt like, oh, I guess they really don't need me to get involved. Um, but I kept going to events and making connections. And then over time, people start to trust you and they start to trust that you're going to, they can count on you to show up over and over again and that you're going to be involved in this. And so I really encourage people to take those steps uh, as to new people. I mean, I just say the time is now, um, I have people that say to me like, yeah, we kind of watching this and you know, if, uh, we're kind of taking a wait and see approach and you know, if things go awesome and, uh, this is, this goes well, like we might jump in and join. And I'm like, you know, that's, that's part of the problem. That's not the solution. The time is now. The time is now to get involved, to get engaged, and take ownership of the industry so that we can leave it better than we found it. Beautiful. Okay. So before we wrap up here, I'm hoping that both Katie and Mark can tackle my last question because I'm curious here. So I'm going to have Mark tackle it first. Um, Mark, I'm curious what you see as the number one issue that is impacting restoration contractors today. Ooh, that's a toughie. So I would, I'm going to talk about what it is for me. And I think, um, you know, Montana is kind of like the U S in some ways or this big, big, huge state. And we got these dense pop population centers, none of them are real big, but they're kind of around the edge of the, the edge of the state, kind of like a, in the U.S., we got this big, huge country with these real dense population areas around the edge. And so what I experience, I think, in Montana, people uh, who operate outside of Montana probably experience in their markets. But every single day, one of the biggest challenges I have is finding employees for our business who are the right fit with our culture, who are the right fit with our customers, who want to be able to find a, uh, a career path that they can be successful and provide for their families or provide for themselves and what their goals are. And that's a real challenge if the opportunity has an entry price point or wage point that is less than what Taco Bell is paying. And that doesn't work. So if we are going to have as an industry something that sustains itself, we got to pay people, we got to be able to have a, a way that people can get into this industry where it makes sense, uh, not like putting sour cream on a taco shell. And so we need to see uh, an industry that has a level of vibrancy in it, that it makes sense for people to invest the future of their life in it and to see it as a career path and a trade that, that gives them long-term opportunity. And I think there are some of those places where that exists, but I get back to the fire restoration issue. If you are doing serious fire restoration right now, you are using a lot of cleaning labor. That's the labor that a lot of the pricing codes use is clean labor. Go back to your cleaning code, that code, open up that item and look and see what the worker wage is based on. Very rarely will you find cleaning technician in that as far as the worker wage over $14 an hour. In fact, I think there's probably very rare cases where that's over $14 an hour. I can tell you in my market in Montana, I cannot bring someone into our company that we would want to hire for $14 an hour. That's our biggest challenge. Beautiful. All right, Katie, it's your Absolutely. turn. What's the biggest I agree challenge? with Mark. I'm interviewing this week and making offers and none of them are $14 an hour. So that's, that's an issue for all of us, no matter where we live. But I think, you know, sometimes some contractors, if you're heavy on the TPA side, we're, we're completely independent, but that doesn't mean that we don't have some of the same issues with the reviewers. And, and, you know, there's so many different carriers and so many different rules and keeping up with those, but it's, you just feel like you're on your own and you're fighting for every dollar. And it would be just awesome if we had some resources that we could use to back up our positions of why we need to get paid for the work that we're doing. Uh, so that is a huge issue now, but the good news is that that's changing soon um, due to the work of the AGA. And I am so excited about it. All right. Are there, is there anything else, Mark or Katie, that you want to add before we wrap this up? If anybody has questions on the side, as well in the chat area. Let me look real quick and see if there are questions that people have made. Lots of comments about muting. Um, there's some comments. Steve asked a question about a clarifying statement regarding what happened with Bill Loveland and that he- Yeah, and I see there's a similar comment from Mr. Cross, um, which we did address perhaps maybe before Mr. Cross um, joined us, which was that, that Mr. Loveland had, um, 
uh, asked for and agreed to the opportunity to address the audience. And, and I think the, the way it was described was is to set the record straight and also to answer questions. And, um, you know, again, I, I want to be clear. Um, I uh, am appreciative that Mr. Loveland did that. I thought that was um, very um, courageous of him to do that, to step up and to answer those questions. I appreciate the spirit that he's um, stated that he wants to work with RIA on this. And uh, now the next step is to actually see that happen. And for us to see that, that statement honored in us being able to actually work together to get to a place that is, is fair for contractors. Katie, do you have anything else you want to pop in there? Yeah, this goes along with Steve's comment uh, in the chat about us putting out a statement to make sure that the people know that we didn't ambush anyone. Um, we did talk about that, but we, we knew that, especially with going live, that people are responding to, to video much faster, and we know that. I mean, we have had some, some issues getting control of our social media pages, but Mark and I are working to, to fix that. We are in the middle of, of changing to a new management company, so you should be seeing a lot of positive changes for the RIA and the member experience. Um, but it is our goal to, we, we wanna keep putting the articles out, but we know how hard it is to find time to, to read articles. So we're trying to reach you in as many ways as we possibly can. So you should be seeing more of these meetings. Um, we should be seeing more live or meetings with with Ed and just making sure that we're keeping you up to date on the progress that's happening any way we can. Last comment I would make on the same vein, Michelle, is that I hear from some of our members that they have reached out to us and they've not got a response. And that's unacceptable. To me, it's unacceptable to our board. It's unacceptable uh, on, on every level. We wouldn't accept that in our businesses if we had customers that called that didn't get response. And, and, and we've taken that seriously. We've made changes and we have um, in the, the structure that we are moving into on January 1st, we will have a fully dedicated member support um, staff member who their job is to make sure that our members get what they need, that they have a great experience with RIA. And, um, you know, for, uh, for us as leaders at RIA, the buck stops with us. And we apologize for any cases where someone hasn't got a response. And I don't know that we know, we know about some of those times that that happens. Um, and it's, it's not acceptable. And we're working to make sure that that never happen again. I can't, I, that's, I, I over, I can't say it will never happen again. We probably will make it, we will probably fumble at some point, but we are going to reduce it massively. And you can, I think everyone knows my email address in the world uh, because of the number of volume of emails I get every day. But, um, but be, please reach out to me. I'll do the best I can. I mean, it's a, a, a lot, again, this is something we all are we're doing the best we can as volunteers to juggle the ball. But, but uh, we, this is really important to us. Okay. Well, thank you very much to everyone who has joined us here today. Again, this was being recorded, so hopefully we will be able to post this again to share. And for people who um, are curious on what the AGA is up to, there are monthly AGA reports that are out. You can find those on the CNR website, the RIA website, which is restorationindustry.org. You can find them on RNR's website. You can find them on Facebook pages. There are monthly updates everywhere. So um, please be on the lookout for those so you can keep up to date on what's going on, plus looking for future videos like this. I know Mark, who is the president-elect of the RIA is, and the rest of the board are really passionate about um, making sure that they are communicating more with the industry and what's happening and keeping you all up to date, like Katie said. So um, thank you again to everyone who joined us here today. And please be on the lookout for when this video is reposted so you can share it with your followers to show them what's happening in the industry because there are great things happening. Excellent. I just did the worst thing a guy can do. I just put my, my uh, email address in the chat comment. So I'm a glutton for punishment. So marketdayspringrestoration.com. Michelle, thank you so much. We appreciate uh, all the support that R&R &R, uh, has given to this movement. Thank you for posting our um, reports. I think the AGA reports are one of the first times that the industry has cross-published a document in every place possible. So that's so encouraging to me. Thank you for doing that, for being here today. 
Uh, we, we just appreciate your support and partnership. And uh, thank you to everyone who's been with us. Please join us in this movement. And uh, as I uh, will, you'll hear me say many, many times, the best is yet to come. So join us for that future. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you.